flowers are the plant reproductive organs that produce sex cells and future generations. Flowers are diverse in size and shape and color. They may be designed to attract certain animals, bees, butterflies, bats, or birds. Some may even be designed to take advantage of the wind and rain in order to reproduce. Let's look at flowers. We'll begin with the vegetative or the non-reproductive parts of the flower. And you probably should know this for, for the test, sepals, petals, and pedicels. Let's have a look. You'll want to know about the petals and what they do, the sepal and what it does, and the pedicel and how it functions for the exam. The petals were designed to attract pollinators like insects and birds. Did you know that blues and violets generally attack, attract bees and reds often attract hummingbirds? The sepals protected the reproductive parts of the flower as they develop. Sepal is Greek for covering and the pedicel is the base upon which the flower develops. Pedicel is Greek for a little foot. It's at the foot of the flower and connects the flower itself to the stem. Here you see the sepals of a tomato flower beginning to open. The sepals are small, green, and leaf-like structures located at the base of the flower. They protect the flower bud. And because they have green in them, they have chlorophyll on them, they actually can produce sugars through photosynthesis. The hard green sepals of the tomato here bend back as the flower opens. You may be familiar with the sepals of a rose because they're very, very sharp. Petals are located just inside of the sepals of the developing flower. Petals appear leaf-like and are often very colorful. The function of these bright colored petals is to attract pollinators. Now we talk about sex. The reproductive parts of the flower are the stamen and the pistil. Stamen, or Greek for thread, is the male part, consisting of a filament and an anther. We'll look at this in a minute. Pistil, which is Latin for bowl, is the female part of the flower. It consists of three parts, which you'll need to know. Here's a complete flower with both male and female components. The anther is on the top of the filament. Here's the filament here, which is the thread. The anther contains pollen. And the female component consists of a stigma, a sticky stigma here where the pollen will land and germinate. The style, which the pollen flows, grows down through any ovary where the pollination occurs. We'll take a look at this again. The stamen is the male reproductive organ. It consists of a pollen sac, the anther, and a long filament supporting the pollen sac. The filament holds the anther in position, making the pollen available for dispersal by the wind, the insects, or the birds. Here you see the filament again and the pollen sac. This anther contains lots and lots of little tiny pollen grains. Some filaments can be quite beautiful. Here you can see all these little pollen grains inside the pollen sac of the anther. The pistil is the plant's female part. It's generally shaped something like a bowling pin and is located in the flower's center. It consists of a stigma, a style, and an ovary. The stigma on top uh, is sticky and connected to the, to the ovary through the style. The ovary contains the egg cells or the ovules. If an egg cell is fertilized, the ovule will then develop into a seed and, and the ovary into a fruit. The 
The pistol may appear in many shapes. The top of the pistol is the stigma. Here you can see these sticky stigmas waiting for pollen to land. You can see lots of tiny little stigmas. They're sticky and waiting for the pollen to, to land on them and germinate, growing down through the style and into the ovary. The function of the style seems to be simply to put the stigma up in the air so it can capture pollen grains. Here you see an ovary containing ovules or little female sex cells. They will develop into immature seeds and eventually into usable seeds. Here's a closer look at the ovules, which will develop into seeds, sitting inside an ovary, which will expand and develop into a fruit in some plants. Pollination occur, occurs when pollen moves from the anther to the stigma of the same flower or another. In nature, flowering plants accomplish pollination in a number of different ways. Colorful scented flowers attract birds, insects, bats, and other animals. These creatures unknowingly pick up pollen from the anthers, and they visit another flower, they deposit the pollen on the stigma. The plant rewards pollinators with sugary nectar. Other plants rely on the wind to transfer pollen. The force of the wind physically moves pollen from one flower to another. Since there's no need to attract pollinators, these plants often do not produce colorful flowers with large petals, scents, or nectar. Once the pollen germinates in the stigma, it grows down through the style and then fertilizes the ovary. Fertilization occurs when the pollen or the male sex cell fuses with the egg cell to form an embryo, which becomes a developing seed. Some flowers are called complete because they contain both male and female parts. Others are called incomplete as they contain either one or the other. There's two types of plants that have incomplete flowers. Monoecious plants have separate male and female flowers in the same plant, things like corn and pecan. Dioecious plants have separate male and female plants. Examples are like holly and ginkgo, pistachio. In order to set fruit, male and female plants must be planted close enough together for pollination to occur. In some cases, like in the holly, the fruit is desirable. In others, like the ginkgo, the fruit is not desirable because one of the flowers smells pretty badly. In fact, the female flower, ginkgo flowers stink. Corn is a monoecious plant with incomplete flowers in which on the top of the plant there's a tassel or the male pollen, and on the ear, above the ear, there's a the silk, which is, represents the stigma. Both are found in the same plant. Monoecious means one household because both male and female are on the same plant. In the dioecious plant, they'll either have one male or, or a female flower on separate plants. In asparagus, the males are actually more productive because they don't so-called waste energy on producing fruits. Female asparagus plants are not as productive. In the ginkgo tree, it's the male that's also preferred because the um, female flowers of the ginkgo kind of smell pretty badly. Did you know that technically a tomato is not a vegetable, but botanically it's called a fruit because it comes from a fertilized ovary. The same from green beans. Green beans contain seeds and therefore are fruits from a botanical perspective. Fruit such as this yellow fleshed watermelon here, consists of fertilized mature ovules, which are seeds, plus the ovary wall, which may be fleshy as in an apple or dry and hard as in an acorn. In some fruits, the seeds are enclosed within the ovary like watermelon, apples, peaches, oranges, squash, cucumbers. In other fruits, seeds are situated on the outside of the fruit like corn and strawberries. A tomato is a typical, simple fruit. We harvest it fully mature in the garden since this gives us the best flavor.
whereas tomatoes are harvested when they're mature. If you leave a cucumber unharvested, the seeds will develop and get hard and dry, and the fruits becomes bitter and not edible. We harvest cucumbers as immature fruits, unless we're saving seeds for next year. And then we have the so-called seedless watermelon. They actually do have seeds. These little ovules here are underdeveloped seeds. They don't develop, they don't mature into seeds. They're pre-seeds. They can easily be eaten. So we call it a seedless watermelon. And then we've got pumpkins, which are botanically a fruit, although they're often considered a vegetable for cooking purposes. They have mature seeds in them when they're harvested as well. And here's a little girl of my, one of my friends. Okay, this can be confusing. We think about green beans as vegetables, as that's how we eat them. But they have seeds inside of them. So botanically, they're a fruit. Maybe a test question, too. And how about dry beans? Well, in dry beans, the seeds are harvested and the pods are thrown away. But the pods are actually the, f the fruit that contain the seeds. In sweet corn, the seeds don't form inside of a fruit, but outside on the cob. Here's my son, Brian, who's now 40 years old and a professor at the University of Rhode Island. Doesn't much like it when I use this picture, but here's, he loves eating those seeds. Well, how about broccoli? Broccoli are actually flower buds. If you don't harvest this heads, the flower will open up. They're generally yellow. They'll pollinate and produce seeds to plant next year. In this photo, you can see a little bit of a yellowish tinge in the flower buds here because they're starting to open up. This should have been harvested yesterday. What about rhubarb? Well, think back to our section on leaves. The part of the part plant that we eat is actually a petiole that holds up the leaf. Rhubarb is the petiole of a leaf perspective, we might think of it as a fruit because it's used to make a pie. Let's take, let's take a closer look at seeds now. Here's a young bean plant. And of course the functions of a seed is probably a pretty good test question too. The seed protects the young embryo from harm, provides nutrition for the developing embryo, and allows dispersal of the embryo or embryo over space and time. If we look at the parts of the seeds, we see the young embryo. It's a miniature plant in an arrested state of development. It'll begin to grow when the conditions are favorable. The endosperm, also called a cotyledon, is a built-in food supply, which can be made up of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. It'll feed the young embryo. And the seed coat, or the harder outer coating, protects the seed from disease and insects. It also prevents water from entering the seed and initiating germination before the proper time. So at that young embryo, you notice it has two parts, a plumule, which will become the leaves, and a radical, which will become the roots. If you open up a bean seed, you can see the little plumule, a little tiny baby leaf. You can see the radical, which will grow down to a root. And you can see most of the, of the seed is made up of cotyledon or endosperm, which will feed the, your growing embryo. Germination, then, is a process by, by which the seed embryo goes from a dormant state to an active growing state. Before any visual signs of germination appear, the seed must absorb water through its seed coat. It also must have enough oxygen and a favorable temperature to begin growing. The first thing we see as the seed begins to absorb moisture is the radical will begin to emerge and start growing downward. This becomes the root system. The root system always develops first. Notice this is a fibrous root system and you can see the young uh, roots growing downward. You can even see some beginnings of some root hairs on the side of the root there.
Once the root system is in place, the plumule will emerge above the soil line. You can see the leaves developing here, using the carbohydrate that's stored in this, in this uh, cotyledon to, for early growth. The cotyledons will eventually shrivel up and fall off the plant. Here you can see two cotyledons making this bean plant a dicotyledonous plant, or a dicot. Seed germination is dependent on, on adequate water, the right temperature, and oxygen. Most seeds contain less than 20% water themselves, so they begin to take up water to resume metabolic activity. Enzymes are then activated, which begin digesting the stored food in the cotyledon, starting to feed the plant to grow. Seeds of different species tend to have different germination temperatures, but most vegetables will germinate somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So when a seedling has the right temperature and enough moisture, it'll begin to grow. If it doesn't have enough oxygen because the soil is too wet, that'll become a problem too. This is a large greenhouse down in Virginia I visited one time. That's me sitting on the ground there. In this greenhouse, the seeds on the left are germinating very poorly. This causes a huge economic loss for this greenhouse. The photo on the right shows much better germination. This is lettuce seedlings in a hydroponic greenhouse. When seeds are planted in the soil, the seed must, seed bed must be made up of loose, fine textured soil, so it has just the right amount of moisture and oxygen. Seeds that are planted too deep may not germinate, and seeds that are planted too shallow may dry out. Some seeds make a pretty good human food. Remember, they're rich in nutrients. They're often sweet because they've got sugars in them. They're easy to transport and they store. And many seeds will taste pretty good. Here's a few of those seeds that are good to eat. We're going to take a look, closer look at peanuts. Here's a dried peanut. The capsule that contains the peanut is a dried up fruit. The seeds are inside. There's two seeds in this one. Uh, of course, they have to be roasted. And once they're roasted, they won't germinate. Next time you eat a peanut, take a look at inside of it. Sometimes there's that dry seed coat on the outside. The cotyledon contains all the nutrients, you know. And often you can see the plumule and the little radical that are inside the seed uh, once, it's, once it's roasted. Here's a good test question. Did you know the peanut that we eat is an underground fruit? Look how it grows. It starts with a flower on the, on the plant. After the flower is pollinated, that little pedicel here starts to grow. It actually grows down and buries its head in the soil. Here's a peanut plant with a fibrous root system. That little pedicel is grown down from the flower and the nut or the fruit containing seeds is growing underground. I'll bet you thought nuts grow on trees. Very few of your friends are gonna know that a peanut is a fruit that grows underground. You'd be hit at the next party if you show them the internal parts of a peanut and tell them all you know. And you better know this anyway because it's probably on a test.